Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to our second episode of Swimming Podcast. If you're new here, I'm Kate, and every week I talk with different people who have positively impacted the sport of swimming. This episode, you guys are in for a treat. My guest is a three-time Olympian, 18-time NCAA champion, founder of Lead Sports Summit, and she was also one of the stars in the movie Touch the Wall. Absolutely love that movie. With that said, let's get our guest, Carolyn Joyce, on the show. Kara, thank you so much for making the time to talk to me on my podcast today. Oh my gosh, I'm honored. I can't believe it's your second episode. This is awesome. I'm like really, really proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I had the pleasure of meeting you a few years ago, a few years ago in person um, when you visited my team. And I know that's something I will always remember and my teammates will always remember. And uh, my question for you is, what is it like for you um, when you get to go to visit age group swimmers across the country? That is um, probably one of the coolest parts of my job. (laughs) I just love being able to meet new people and share my experience and hopefully inspire them because, believe it or not, like it wasn't that long ago that I was, you know, right where you and your teammates Mm -hmm. were. Um, You know, I remember being an age group swimmer and getting the opportunity to meet Olympians, whether it was at a clinic or going to a swim camp or something like that and just absorbing every like I wanted to know everything like what do you eat what time do you wake up like mm-hmm. what's doing your spare time and and just getting to know all of that but I think that the best thing about those experiences you know getting to be in person with um kids and age group swimmers is you realize Olympians are just normal people mm-hmm. <laughs> that, yeah you know that committed to something and and made some sacrifices um and set high goals and and achieved them and it's it's attainable for you know it's 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 something that's attainable and I think that's the most important thing is like hey like I'm I'm just like you and you can do this too so getting to visit with club teams and and meeting swimmers like yourself it's it's such an honor and it's it's a joy it's it's my favorite part of, of my job yeah absolutely I remember my favorite part was just obviously the whole clinic thing but getting to hold your medal and seeing it in person <laughs> and taking a picture with it but there's there's one thing I remember um I'm not sure which medal it was I think it was your Beijing medal correct me if I'm wrong but it had a like, jade on the back and it was like broken and it was yes. cracked so do you want to talk about that for like how that yeah. happened yeah, that so you yeah. have an amazing memory. Yeah, <laughs> what you just said is completely spot on. Um, but yeah, so my I have I have four I have four medals. Uh-huh. I have two silvers from the Athens Olympics in two thousand four, and then I have two silvers from the Beijing Olympics in two thousand eight. And mm-hmm. the design for the Olympic medal. So if you're familiar with the Summer Olympics, the design for every Summer Olympic Games, um, the front of the medal is the same. And it's the Greek goddess Nike, which is the goddess of victory. Yes. And then for the Summer Games, the back of the medal is what's always different. So the back of the medal, as well as the, the ribbon or the lanyard that goes around your neck, that's what's unique to the host country. Oh. And Beijing put a really um, kind of different twist on their medals. And they put a ring of jade inlaid on the back of their medals, which is beautiful but also um a little bit fragile and it's actually one of the things that makes the metal so heavy is like there's a big like, cut out stone that's mm-hmm. inlaid in the metal so I was at an event um and I had my metal sitting out on a table um I was working with a bunch of club swimmers I think I might have been at a clinic and um it was the it was a younger sibling probably a little kid three or four years old came over to the table as I was signing autographs and I had my metal sitting out and um and she picked up my Athens medal so my 2004 medal and just kind of boop, like dropped oh it my on gosh. the medal and it you know the kid did not know any better and to this day they don't know that it happened and my medals kind of clink and clank all the time um when I'm you know sharing them or or traveling with them but it clinked and it just made like a different kind of noise and I was like I haven't heard that before and I just kind of picked up the Beijing medal and I looked at it and I was like oh okay and it it has a crack going through it now and it's it's like it's a the jade let me make sure I explain this properly the jade inlay is a ring so it's like in the shape of a donut and it has a crack that goes right through one of the the side of it right around I think 11 o'clock 
on the metal. And mm-hmm. at first, you know, I, it felt like I got punched in the stomach. I was like, oh, <sighs> no, my metal. But then I, I thought about it more, and I was like, okay, Kara, what is the alternative? The alternative mm-hmm. is you leave your medals at home, and you don't have the opportunity to share them with, you know, all of these kids. And, and my medals have been shared, oh, my gosh. <laughs> they've been held thousands of times by swimmers, by, you know, kids in hospitals, by businesses. And, and my goal, you know, in, in having these medals, it's it's not like, oh, I won an Olympic medal. I'm just going to wear it everywhere. I'm going to mm-hmm. vacuum it. I'm going to, you know, wear it to the grocery store. Like, that's not really what they're for. And I feel like once you win it, your job is to kind of pay it forward and to share them. And so, you know, if the alternative to my medal being cracked is my medal sitting pristine on a shelf that never gets seen and it never gets touched and never inspires, then I'd prefer to have a cracked, dented, chipped metal any day of the week. Yeah, um, 100%. And just having having the metal is obviously huge. And I remember, like you said, to this day, I'm still able to remember that and that experience. So obviously, swimming has brought you a lot of places all across the world. Do you remember where your favorite place uh, swimming has taken you and why? Oh, man. Um, I'm sure it's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, I have been so lucky. That's probably one of my favorite things when I look back on my swimming career. Um, One of the coolest parts about being an Olympic swimmer and being a professional swimmer for so long was just all the places I got to see and I got to travel to. And, you know, from obviously Athens and Beijing and London, where my three Olympics were, but also going to, um, you know, Pan American Games and Dominican Republic World Championships in Australia, training camp in Singapore. There's been so many incredible places and, you know, tons of countries in Europe that I've gotten to compete in. But I, so before, let me see, when you make the Olympics, um, Olympic trials for swimming are usually about four weeks before the Mm -hmm. Olympic Games. And right after Olympic trials are over, um, the team assembles at training camp. And they have two phases of training camp before you go to the actual Olympic Games. And it's phase one, which is um, somewhere in the United States. Um, The team assembles for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then phase two, you go to an international location that's very close to the Olympic City, but not in the Olympic City. And you're there for about a week and a half. And so they have phase one where, you know, we're training and we're coming out of our taper and it's a lot of team building experiences and, you know, a lot of processing. There's so much paperwork and things like that when you make the Olympic team. So all of that happens in the States. And then Mm -hmm. phase two, people are like, well, why don't you just go right to where the Olympics are? Well, you know, with the Olympic city, there's so much going on. There's so many people. And so they take us typically to a location that's within the same time zone and, you know, maybe like, a. Uh, within an hour or two flight so when Mm -hmm. we're finally you know done tapering and training and everything and we're ready to go to the olympics we get to the olympic city maybe two or three days before the games start which i think is a really great plan so when we were going to the athens olympics in 2004 our our stateside training camp was in stanford in palo alto at stanford university Mm -hmm. and then our international phase of the training camp was in Spain, but it was in an island (laughs) that Spain owns called Mallorca, Uh Um, and it is probably one of the most beautiful places I have ever been to. I mean, I didn't even know that this place existed before I went there, and it was just like crystal clear waters and beautiful temperatures, and I'm a pretty fair-skinned person, and we trained outside every day, and um, I'm like fair-skinned freckly, and I got like a really dark tan to the point where when I finally, you know, when we got to the Olympics in Athens, and I got to see my family before the game started, they were like, oh, Kara, what (laughs) happened? You (laughs) you look different than we've ever seen you and it was like oh we've been training outside of Mallorca Spain for two weeks but I have a I got a ring um there's like this old town in Mallorca that's like thousands of years old and we went and did a little half day trip there during training camp and I have this beautiful ring that I got at this shop and it's just one of a kind handmade and it has opal has um, black opal in it and opal is my birthstone and the ring is one of a kind and it fit me perfectly and I was like okay this is a sign (laughs) meant to be but it's like one of my favorite memories for my all of my travels and stuff so yeah if, if I had to pick a favorite place and if if you want to put you know a place on your bucket list I would say Mallorca Spain okay uh, to that, be at the top. <laughs> yeah that's that's funny because uh, my guest last week also said Spain um no yeah Spain and Australia were, were his favorite places to go so that's yeah. that's very funny 
Let's just talk about the atmosphere for a moment. Obviously, you have Olympic trials and the Olympics, two completely different things. But I've heard from other athletes that the Olympic trials, um, you have more pressure than the actual Olympics. Can you just walk me through the differences between Olympic trials and Olympics? And then we're going to talk about lead. Yeah, so... Olympic trials is the most stressful, hardest eight days that any swimmer will experience Mm -hmm. because, you know, really you've been training for, for most athletes for your whole life, um, for that moment to qualify for the Olympics. And it's not an easy feat in the U S you know, you have to swim in prelims and get top 16. If you get top 16, you can swim in semifinals. Mm -hmm. So once you swim semifinals, you have to be top eight to swim in finals and then you have to race in finals and finish in the top two Two. yeah to make the olympics and i mean you could break the world record in semifinals swim in finals and get third and Mm -hmm. still not make it so it's almost like when you're in finals at olympic trials times do not matter it only matters what your place is yeah and it's just it's I don't know the best way to describe it. It's agonizing. Um, it's the most emotional eight days that you'll ever experience. And when you're there, I mean, you're watching your friends and you're watching your teammates either have their life goals realized or just shattered in front of them. And so mm-hmm. it's it's the meat that has more tears than any other <laughs> meat that you'll ever go to. But it also has the highest highs. You know, you'll have people that have dreamed of that moment their entire lives and worked hard for it and everything comes together. Um, And you have the Cinderella stories where, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody that went into the meet seated like, you know, 40th, like uh, somehow comes in first or second out of nowhere. And um, so it's it is a very stressful meet. But once it's over and, and if you are lucky to make the Olympics, no matter what happens, you're an Olympian for life and you can go to the Olympics and get last place and you're still an Olympian. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's, it's almost like the Olympics are the icing on the cake. Yeah. And, you know, Team USA, we are so strong internationally when we compete um, that, you know, we're very fortunate to, you know, be in the medal hunt for nearly every race. And then if you're an Olympic medalist, even better. Yeah. But um, just making the Olympics is a huge accomplishment. It's a huge feat. But yes, that meet is really stressful. And my event in particular, you know, I swim 50, the 53 yeah. Yeah, at three Olympics. So I'm the only female, I'm the only American woman to ever do that at three Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. And um, unfortunately for my family, the 53 is on the last day. So it's day eight, the last event of the last session. And it's the last chance to qualify for the Olympics. And so um, I was talking to a friend recently about, um, like, oh, so-and-so swam the 400 free. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's on day one. Can you imagine making the Olympics on day one of Olympic trials? Like, that experience would be so different. So for me, you know, I basically sit around and wait for eight days. And Mm -hmm. um, it is so stressful. And my coach actually is like, Kara, I don't want you to be at finals during this meet if you're not swimming. I want you to be back in your hotel room resting so it's it's crazy but you know my hotel room is across the street from the pool in Omaha like 100 yards away and I Mm -hmm. can't go watch because he knows that I'm too emotionally invested in my friends that like the highs and lows that I'll experience being there in person is just exhausting and it's not the best way for me to prepare for for my own race so that me is yeah it's grueling it is so exhausting but you end up with you know a team of 48 to 52 olympians when it's all over Mm -hmm. and and it is a really cool experience so yes i would 100 percent say olympic trials (laughs) much more stressful (laughs) than the olympics yeah i was actually able to go watch the 2012 and 2016 olympic trials and yeah i remember the 50 being on the last day because one of my teammates actually qualified for the olympic trials to for the 2016 games and I was there for the second to last day and the last day and I was just thinking she she was out there that entire time just waiting to swim and can't imagine how stressful that is but let's let's just talk about lead for a second for those who don't know about this incredible company you founded can you please talk about when you got this idea and why you started it absolutely so um I retired from swimming after the 2012 olympics so i was really Mm -hmm. fortunate to qualify for london and um, when it was all said and done i was like okay i'm 26 you know i went three times i think i think that's 
that's enough. And, you know, I, I was really happy to be able to retire on such a high note. And after I retired, I started doing a lot of clinics, which is where I met you for the first time. Uh-huh. And, and I started working for a company called Swim Labs. And Swim Labs is a swim school based in Denver. They have franchises all over the country now. But at the time, they were only based in Denver, where I was living. And I was teaching private lessons at this swim school. And the swim school works in a way where it's not a normal pool. We teach out of endless pools. So there's oh. like a, a motor in front. The pool is about the size of two hot tubs. And there's like three or four pools at the location. So it's it's not very big. It's maybe like 10 feet long. Um, and then there's a motor in front. So I get to figure out how fast the pool can go. And mm-hmm. when you come for a lesson, you swim in place. And I have cameras. And so I get to see you from like four or five different angles. And I have a big monitor. And so you swim for a little bit. And then we watch your stroke and analyze it. And I can put my stroke next to your stroke. I can put Michael Phelps' stroke next. I can mm-hmm. put pull from our library of, you know, great swimmers and, and help analyze and give you good technique feedback. And so I was doing that for a couple years. And um, more and more, uh, my client roster was growing to be teenage girls. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that happened um, from the movie Touch the Wall that you mentioned earlier. Um, but this fan base of teenage girls that would come and, and their moms would, would bring them in for a lesson and be like, okay, Kara, um, you know, so-and-so's here. And honestly, I don't even care if she swims today. Can you just talk to her for like the 30 minutes? And I'd be like, oh yeah, sure. No problem. And, and so by word of mouth, um, I was getting all of these girls to come and, and swim labs, my people at swim labs would call it swim therapy with Kara. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the wait list for these lessons was getting really crazy, like months and months long for people to come in to see me. And I was like, you know what? I, I definitely understand the value and you know, swim clinics and swim camps, but I I think that there's a need for more than just technique and feedback. I think teenage girls need a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And they can come to me and I have a lot of answers, but I don't have all of the answers, but I do know the women that do have all of the answers. And so that kind of came about the the idea to start the lead sports summit where I could bring together women from all different backgrounds, like sports psychology, nutrition, leadership, confidence, mental Mm -hmm. health, and then bring in a handful of my peers, female Olympic champions that are, you know, incredible and do so much to get back in the sport. And so for four days, you know, bring in teenage girls and then all these specialists and have keynotes and breakouts and really get to the heart of, you know, what their needs are and, and where they're struggling or where they want more information. And, you know, we use the word empowerment a lot in our society. And, and to me, empowering means means helping and, and means giving mm-hmm. information. You know, the more information you have on any topic, the more empowered you are to make a good decision on that topic. And so, you know, if you're coming to the Lead Sports Summit and you have really been struggling with your nutrition, you just don't really understand, you know, what it is that you're supposed to eat. You kind of have a good idea of what healthy food is, but you want to know what time to eat it or, mm-hmm. you know, what's the best thing to have before practice or for recovery or before meat. We can empower you with all of that information. We have the best nutritionist. She comes from swimming and and she's just so phenomenal and provides all of that information. Or if you come to the summit and you're like, I really want to work on my confidence because I work so hard in practice and I feel great and I can lead my lane. But when I get to a swim meet and I'm standing behind the blocks, I freeze, I lock up and I Mm -hmm. don't have the swims that I know I'm capable of. You know, how can I overcome that? Well, you come to lead and you can work with our confidence coach and listen to her talk. And she's going to give you all the tools to help overcome that fear and really get the best out of your performance. So it, we have a, a lot of different topics that we cover, and um, we get feedback afterwards that, um, you know, this is my favorite topic. No, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> and it really depends on what they came for and, and what they wanted to learn. But it's it's an incredible experience for teenage girls. And um, all of the women that come to the event and work it um, as speakers or as guest Olympians or as team leaders, everybody is like, oh, my gosh, I wish I could have gone to this when I was a teenager, Mm -hmm. you know, and and we all kind of come from that, like, what can we provide, you know, what, what did we feel like we were lacking that we can put together and provide for teenage girls, because it's something that's so valuable for, for them, but we, we know exactly, you know, what it is that, that they need, because that was us once, you know, we, we were that not that long ago. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how the Lead Sports Summit came about, and you can check us out at leadsportsummit.com, and, um, our event is over Labor Day weekend, and, um, 
we are almost full actually oh, our wow. registration is almost full so yeah it's it's very cool and for me for this to be my job it's it's such a dream come true and I feel very fortunate every day that um, you know parents entrust me to provide this service for for them and for their kids and and that we can do good and give back yeah what what you're doing is absolutely amazing and what like you said, uh, everybody else you brought on board for this. And I appreciate as a teenage girl myself, thank you for everything you've done and what you're continuing to do. I have just a couple more questions for you, if that's okay. So for a girl in high school or a girl almost in high school, what's if you could choose, I know this is hard, but do you have one piece of advice that you'd wish uh, you knew when you were that age? Jeez. Hmm, I would definitely buy myself a straightener. <laughs> I had, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I I would say don't dwell on the don't dwell on like the bad times or mm-hmm. when you go to a meet and you don't swim as well as you thought you would or you have a string of like bad practices or a couple of weeks or months. You know the the sport that we're in swimming is is long. <laughs> it yeah. is a long waiting game, and I think the people that really excel in this sport are the people that understand it just takes time and it just takes perseverance but it's so easy especially in society today we want instant results we want instant feedback we Mm -hmm. want everything right away but with sports and and with things that are truly worth it you know it's it's about perseverance and Mm -hmm. persevering means that you have things that don't go your way but you don't give up You, you just keep going you just keep working at it because in the end, you know, it's an honest sport and what you put into it, you will get out of it. Yeah. It might not happen exactly when you want it, when you think it's going to happen, but it will happen if you stick with it and you persevere. So I would say don't dwell. Um, you know, it's it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of you as an athlete. You know, it's not the end of you getting a scholarship. It's not the end of you be- making the varsity team. It's just going to take a little bit more time and stick with it because it's so worth it. Yeah, that's great advice and a great answer. And just to wrap it up, I have a fan question for you. Changing topics here. Uh, this fan question is about Touch the Wall. So um, a lot of people are wondering, um, in the end of Touch the Wall, you and Missy uh, go and get the Olympic ring tattoos. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you know what I think you know what I'm asking. Um, yeah. So you just you decide to get the tattoo on your butt, and a lot of people are wondering. Why? Because I know I know a lot of the Olymp like a lot of the Olympians they decide to get them like on the, your suit line or yeah, on the shoulder. Yeah. But w- why did you just decide to get it on your butt? <laughs> well, okay, good question. Um, first of all, tattoos are forever, so be very sure kids, before you think about <laughs> going to the tattoo parlor. I went to the tattoo parlor that day to support Missy. Mm -hmm. I had no intention of getting a (laughs) tattoo myself. And I think tattoos are, like, super cool. People that are into them, like, I totally respect that. Very artsy. It's a great way to express yourself. But it's not really, like, my thing. Mm -hmm. And I never envisioned myself ever getting a tattoo. And so, for me, I was like, well, like... (laughs) Missy is purely laying it on thick with this guilt trip. Like, I did say that I would get one if we both made it. At the time that I, like, agreed to do that, I did not think I was going to make the Olympics. So imagine my shock. (laughs) But um, I wanted to put it in a place where I would never have to see it. (laughs) (laughs) And I wanted to put it in a place where I'm not, like, a flashy person. So if I'm going to go to the pool or I'm going to go to the beach, like, I didn't want it to be showing all the time. Like, I Mm -hmm. can just cover it up and no one ever like I also when we filmed that I never imagined it would actually be in the movie because they filmed everything for like a year and a half like they had 400 hours of footage oh wow and so when they were like oh yeah the tattoo scene made it like when the film people told me the tattoo scene made it in the movie I was like what (laughs) like I had no idea and so the day that we got the tattoo, you know, I'm sitting there with DA, Missy's mom, trying to figure out, like, okay, fine, I'll get it, but I don't want to, like, I don't want to look down every day and see a tattoo if I'm not a tattoo person. Mm-hmm. And so um, when we ended up getting it, and Missy and I took a photo together, and I'm kind of pulling my, my the cheek of my suit down <laughs> a little bit, and she's posing with her hip, and I posted that on Twitter, my older brother texted me right away, and he was like, um, Kara, your butt is on Twitter, and a thousand <laughs> have seen it and I was like oh no like I didn't even think about that and then when it ended up in the movie I'm like well what are you gonna do (laughs) 
So oh I don't gosh. regret getting it. You know, I'm, I'm honored that I could have that experience with Missy and, you know, follow through on the promise that I made her. Um, but I am, I have no regrets on where I got it. I don't have to look at it every day. I can only, I can show it to people if I really want to, but it's not something that shows, you know, when I'm in a bathing suit. Yeah, I'm sure just getting it with Missy was just a, a great experience. But with that, um, <laughs> with that, I'm going to wrap up the podcast here. Thank you so much for joining me and talking about, obviously, your career and lead and everything. I had a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such an honor and congratulations on launching this podcast. You're such a natural and this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. That's a wrap on episode two. I'll put all of Kara's social media accounts and more information about lead in the link in description. And thank you guys for listening. See you next episode.